Hey guys and shine, and welcome to the I Give a Damn podcast, brought to you by Floracy Media, the same company behind ODs on Facebook. Today our guest is Dr. Walt Whitley, a master and presenter of all things ocular surface disease. Today he keeps us updated on new diagnostics and treatment options coming up in the realm of dry eye disease, which is a topic that's always very popular here. So without further ado, please hit those like, subscribe, and follow buttons, and join me with this conversation with Dr. Walt Whitley. Can you just start off for, for all of our viewers, our listeners who's just coming in, clicking on this, maybe you've never met you, can you please fill us in where you work or where you practice and what do you do? You bet. My name is Walt Whitley first. Glad to be here. So <laughs> thanks for the invitation. My name is Walt Whitley. I'm the director of optometric services at Virginia Eye Consultants in Norfolk, Virginia, where my practice, I see patients about three and a half days a week. Uh, my other role within the practice, I'm a director of professional relations and education, and also regional medical director for eye care partners. So I wear a couple hats within the practice. Um, the practice itself, tertiary referral care practice, and so we have all the various specialties. I oversee the dry eye clinic within the practice as well. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's what my days are like. A lot of everything. <laughs> it's, a lot, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot to handle, right? With uh, being trained and you're working with many different specialists, like cornea specialists, so you see a lot of disease. Yeah, yeah. And so within the practice, we have uh, three cornea specialists. We have three glaucoma, two retina, two oculoplastics. I have eight ODs on my team. And within our practice, we do the surgical part, we do the treatment part, but we want the referring optometrist in our area to practice at the highest level of the profession or, as, or what they feel comfortable with. And so we say, hey, whenever you need us, we're here. But if we're not treating that patient, or we're not managing something, we send those patients back to the referring optometrist. And so as professional relations, that's my role. And <laughs> I've, my, my whole career, I've, I did a residency in a uh, co-management center. And so it's all collaboration, how we can work together. We know that if we just look at the supply demand, there's not enough ophthalmologists. We know there's growth within optometry. And we know that people are getting older. And there's a whole lot of them. And so we just need to do, yes, the vision, but take a more active role within the medical eye care. So I, I feel that, I definitely feel that. Not just like in, and I agree with you, but like in, in our practice where I'm at in Minnesota, I feel that very same thing. Uh, how did you even find yourself working in such a collaborative type of clinic and focusing on so much on disease? Well, I graduated from Pacific University. And so in that area, PCLI, Pacific Cataract and Laser Institute, they were big, they, they're still big, and they have a model where they have optometrists and ophthalmologists working closely together, mm -hmm. practicing you know, their skill set. Optometrists as a clinician, the surgeon as a surgeon, but working together. I was actually going to go into private practice, but, and so life happens. So I was going to join a solo practitioner, but that's when there was a lot of the, the, uh, the mergers or a lot of the practices were coming together to more group practices, and just the timing wasn't right. And so there was a residency in, in where I'm from in Nevada with Doug DeVries, who's mm -hmm. one of my mentors. And uh, so I was with him for about a year, and then I stayed on for about four more years. But one of the things I really want to get into is clinical research. And so there was an opportunity where I was actually helping students and residents. I always look for opportunities and try to connect them to get them their, their next position. But there was an opportunity. I'm like, this is John Shepard's practice. And John Shepard, he's cornea, uveitis, external disease specialist in our practice. One of my good friends and another mentor of mine and partner. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I saw this op opportunity. I'm like, this is Shepard's practice. And so it was for me at the time, there's only three providers, two cornea and one oculoplastics. And they said, hey, come on over. Your job is to grow the practice, all right? Make relationships, you know, and, uh, and, and work within the community. And so that's what I did. And uh, yeah, so now we're up to 24 providers within the practice and we've just grown and grown. Well, congrats on that. We, I think anybody who, who's ran a business or has worked in that, that sort of place knows there's a lot of work that goes involved, a lot of thought, a lot of planning. Yeah. So congrats on that. Well, thank you. Thank you, you. you mentioned research. Mm -hmm. You have interest in that, and you've, you've done some research? Yeah. Yeah, so I've been involved with over a dozen clinical trials, and so a lot of that, you may know, I do a lot within the dry eye space. Mm -hmm. And so I've been involved with many of those medications that are on the market today, whether it's a nutraceutical, so, uh, such as a, the Hydroi formulation, which has mm -hmm. GLA in it. So we typically think of omega and omega-3 when it comes to nutrition and dry eye. However, there's a potent 
anti-inflammatory omega-6, which is GLA formulation, and so we did those studies. We were involved with neurostimulation studies, uh, various versions of cyclosporin, uh, perfluoral hexaloctane or MIBO we are mm. part of as well. And it's, it's been a fun, fun uh, aspect of what, what I get to do because lecturing as well, I have been involved with in the research, but then get to share some of those learnings, key learnings from there. Right. And you get like firsthand experience, like early with the patients yeah. during those trials yeah. and going, you have to understand what's going on. You have yeah. to deep dive into it, so. But we can do it without a team. So we have a whole clinical research team. And uh, so there's about three people uh, on that team. But you know, what's interesting is I had, a, I have some people go, hey, how did you know that, you know, how did you not know that that was the drug or that was the placebo? I said, I'm not supposed to know. I said, that's why it's called double mass, double blind. <laughs> that's called science and research. So, uh, but, it, but it's been a, a, a fun aspect of, of my clinic. That's, uh, I love that. With uh, dry eye, uh, you, you've, you speak on dry eye quite a bit, and I've gone to many of your lectures, which are all fantastic, by the way. But when it comes to dry eye, what do you think, uh, first, our industry has... I think dry eye has always been there, but it has become a monster in the last probably decade. Mm -hmm. And why do you think that's that's become and grown the way it has? Great question. There is so much innovation within the dry eye space right now. First, it's it's a quality of life issue for our patients. Our patients have been suffering. There's only been one therapeutic treatment option um, for many years, which was cyclosporin or restasis that came out in 2003. And I graduated 2002, and so I grew up with restasis, and so just seeing what the various treatment options that were available, but it wasn't helping everybody. It helps thousands and millions of patients, and I have many of my patients still on restasis. However, there's there's been an unmet need of how can we find other other pharmaceuticals, other treatments that can help improve the symptoms, mm -hmm. improve the signs, and so that's why you're seeing some of the newer pharmaceutical agents that have been approved for both the signs and the symptoms, whether it's gonna be the eye dryness score, whether it's gonna be total corneal stain, fluorescein staining, or inferior corneal staining, or conjunctival hyperemia. There's different endpoints in, uh, uh, when it comes to that, but the, the unmet need is why there's so much uh, innovation. We're seeing a lot within the MGD treatments and with first, we had the micro, micro buffer exfoliation with Blefex, and we saw thermal pulsation with Lipaflow, and now we have the ILEX square. I can keep going and going, <laughs> uh, but, but the reason for that is because we're learning. We're constantly learning about dry eye. Before, everything was inflammation. Now we're hearing, hey, there's this thing called evaporation where 86% of all dry eye has an evaporative component. But then we're like, hey, wait a second. These patients, we had them on medications. That surface is not getting any better. Why does this patient still have three plus staining? And we've had them on lafitograss, cyclosporin. We know that these drugs work. If it's not working, we have to rethink our diagnosis. And that's where something like neurotrophic keratitis mm -hmm. comes in. And now we have treatments such as amniotic membranes, autologous serum, or even Oxervate or Senergimin, which has been a life changer for many patients. I agree. I've, I've seen that firsthand with some of my patients. And now even so, so far that with my dry eye protocols, I'm always testing for coronal sensitivity, whether they have a significant history or not. I'm just like, let's just mark this off our list at least. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, in your practice, how what is a typical dry? How do you approach dry eye assessment when you have a patient that you're like, I think this is just dry eye, but let's do a full workup. So everybody has dry eye until proven otherwise, and so it's different because it depends on what that patient presenting for that reason for the visit. Mm -hmm. So within my daily practice, probably about forty percent of my patients have dry eye. 30% are pre and post-op, cataract, cornea, retina, whatever the, the, the surgery was, emergency eye care, glaucoma, uh, whatever, whatever it may be. And so if they're there for, let's say it's not a dry eye, I'm still looking. And mm -hmm. so I make sure that all of my patients, and I've been at the practice for about 17 years now, I make sure that every patient has at least had my biography so I know what that structure looks like. It's also important for us to press on those glands to see what is the function, what's coming out of those glands as well. Um, but I do take a look at the dryness, asking them questions at every visit. Itch, burn, do you feel the need to use eye drops? Does your vision change or fluctuate throughout the day? There's numerous questions we can ask. But the biggest symptom patients that have, which is the number one reason for any visit to eye care provider, whether it's vision or medical, is blurred vision. Well, tell me more. 
If it's always blurry, it's refractive error, cataracts, but if it changes or fluctuates, that's an unstable tear film. It's something we need to reappoint. So let's say that that was that glaucoma patient had the fluctuating vision. So yes, you can put them on whatever tear you want, but you have to remember if patients are noticing these symptoms, they've tried three different artificial tears. And so it's not necessary give them the next flavor of artificial tears. The, uh, for dry eye workup, though, if they're coming specifically for dry eye, we make sure that we have the symptom questionnaire, and so we use a speed questionnaire. So before I even get in the room, I already know that this patient has an issue that we and, and how severe it is, and it gives me a metric. So I know what the baseline is, so anything I, could, I do, we can see if we're improving or not. And so using that um, point of care testing, and so part of the protocol, the technicians, they're gonna do tear osmolarity, mm -hmm. they're gonna do MMP9 testing or testing for inflammation, By t and they're gonna do myography, by the time I see the patient, then I'm gonna do my assessment, having the patient look down. We're hearing more about these little mites uh, that <laughs> patients have. And um, pressing on the glands, looking to see is there any presence of telangiectasia? Because if there is, then I'm thinking this patient's gonna need IPL uh, 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 for them. Fluorescein stain, lysamine green, looking at the tear film stability or lack thereof. Mm -hmm. Two plus higher or care of SPK with symptoms, I'm doing corneal sensitivity testing, as you mentioned. But one other thing that I've added is looking at the lid seal, an incomplete lid mm -hmm. seal. So take it, doing the core blacky light test, having that patient close their eyes, put that pen light on the, on the lid. And if you see any glow underneath the eyelashes, that patient has an incomplete lid seal. What that looks like staining wise is inferior corneal staining. Mm -hmm. And so the treatment for that we know is gonna be ointments patients, some do it, some don't. We know it causes blur and whatever else. Uh, I've been using uh, tape tarsorophy for those patients. Mm -hmm. So we thought those patients had dry eye, and this is one of the questions you had earlier. And then I've been able to address their condition because it was an incomplete closure, do a tape tarsorophy with the hypoallergenic lid tape. I've been able to get some patients off their chronic medications because it wasn't dry eye. It's the darn air that keeps blowing <laughs> on their eyes. So that's my short answer to my dry eye workup. I love that. Uh, it, I think it's it's important and it's something I, I like to visually picture as, as dry eye specialists and, and practitioners are explaining that because I can be in my own seat and picture all those tests being done and how they play a role in a diagnosis and eventually into recommending a treatment. But you don't need all those tests. I mean, look at the lids, mm -hmm. do a stain, look at the tear foam breakup time and prescribe something. Right. And a good history. A good history. Yeah, because that can take us really far, just understanding what's going on. Maybe there's a recurrent coronal erosion, mm -hmm. and the patient doesn't know what those symptoms, how they match up. Whenever I do a talk, I always challenge the audience, and I say, hey, who uses a speed questionnaire or whatever questionnaire? And, you know, maybe 20, 30 percent raise their heads. I say, well, the next week or the next day you're in clinic, use it on all your patients that day. And you're going to find up to 50 percent of your patients are having those symptoms. We're just not asking about it. What about treatments? Uh, now, you've said you've been involved in all of these research studies, um, and, and your clinic, I imagine you have a lot available. Uh, what are some of your um, probably big go-tos that you find most success with? Well, that's an easy one. All of them. <laughs> and you have to know all of them. You have to understand all of them. Before, when uh, Lofitogras or Zydra came out, so we had Zydra and Restasis. People go, well, what do you like? Zydra or Restasis? Which guy are you? I said, I'm both. I said, it's not my choice. It's called the insurance company. And so you have to understand those drops and understand and set realistic expectations. One of the things that helps is knowing your ins insurance plans and knowing your patient's insurance plans, mm -hmm. knowing which they're more likely to get this medication, which one they're more likely to get this medication. Um, and there's different specialty pharmacies that do help, mm -hmm. uh, help address a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And so here, here's the example we, with Zydra. So being part of the clinical studies, if we broke that down, patients with moderate to severe symptomatology were the ones that showed the improvement in symptoms as little as two weeks. So patients been complaining, they want improvement. I'm thinking, hey, we need an anti-inflammatory. Uh, and, and then Zydra is something that they can use twi twice a day. Or let's say it was Restasis at the time. We, we've all had that patient. Oh, I've tried Restace, it didn't work. Well, how long do you use it? Two weeks? Well, it's not gonna work in two weeks. You know, it's gonna take three to four months for it to kick in. But as you do it twice a day, you're gonna feel more tears after the first month. Next month, you're gonna feel even more tears, but it's gonna take three to four months for it to fully mm -hmm. kick in. And so setting those expectations for patients, but with the newer drops, we need to know those too. 
evaporation with MIBO that's out, that we use it up to four times a day or four times a day, which is the FDA uh, uh, indication, but treating the symptoms, treating the, uh, the total corneal fluorescein staining. Mm -hmm. We've never seen data like this before where perfluorohexyl octane, well, essentially what it does, it's gonna help inhibit evaporation. And so it's gonna last on the eye for up to six hours, patients use it four times a day, but works in as early as day 15 is what was found in the clinical studies. So I'm like, wow, this is great. Majority of patients have evaporative component, we're gonna need this drop. But then we still can't forget the inflammation. By the time patients are coming to us complaining, by the time that patient comes and using artificial tears three to four, or three to four, 12 times a day, whatever it may be, the cat's already been out of the, whatever that phrase is, whatever's <laughs> out of the bag. And so we know that dry eye is a chronic progressive condition. So if it's been going on for some time, that leads to inflammation, that leads to the ocular surface damage, mm -hmm. we're gonna need an anti-inflammatory. So the question is, what do you use now? Well, if there's inflammation, you still need an anti-inflammatory, but if there's evaporation, you can still use something like MIBO. So we're all figuring this out together, but that's why it's been so exciting having these treatments. And then we have the newest one, which is cyclosporin 0.1%, which is the mm -hmm. highest concentration where the vehicle is perfluorobutyl pentane. Essentially, it's just a carrier. Drug delivery is an exciting topic when it comes to dry eye. When you take a hydrophobic drug such as cyclosporin, have it at the highest concentration, it's water-free, but it helps get it into the tissues to render its effects. That's so why like twice a day, patients are showing improvement in both the symptoms and signs as little as a month. Right, yeah. and that's, that's just becoming available now. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it is exciting times going forward. Uh, speaking with that, I've seen you lecture on like new dry eye treatments, like in the pipeline, that sort of thing. Uh, do you mind sharing any uh, just anecdotes, things that excite you about what might be coming down down in the future? Yeah, I had a talk earlier um, uh, earlier this week with with a company that's it's called uh, Rinsada, mm -hmm. um, and so with this company, essentially what the, what's going on is we've heard about the biofilm, we know bacteria that creates a film that, that, that secretes the lipases that clog the meibomian glands that are within the soft tissues. However, we put drops, we do lid cleansers, but there's a thing called the fornix, the inferior and superior. We have no idea what's being grown underneath those areas and we don't do anything about it. And so this is an in-office procedure where you can do a rinse. And so you're just flushing it, just like we go to the dentist and they take that super duper fast water pick and get all that junk off our teeth. Same thing, we're gonna take this, we're gonna quickly lavage out the inferior and superior fornix. And that is another way that we can address inflammation. And there's studies that show that it did decrease the inflammation or bio, biomarkers, uh, MMP9, uh, but using it for that. And when I was talking with the, with, with the, with the group, where, with, with, with the team at Rinsana, we were starting to talk about allergies. Right now is allergy season. What happens to allergies? We have too much pollen. Uh, the histamine gets released. If there's a way that we can flush all this out that still is being harbored in the inferior superior fornix, that's one of the treatments. But that's just this week. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're, we hear so much about IPL. <laughs> there's low level light therapy, there's radio frequency. And so, biggest thing is just look at the data. And, and, it, and I use data all the time and share it. Share it and set expectations for patients because that's very important. And that's how you're able to be successful. Because not every patient's going to be that patient's going to say, oh, my eyes feel awesome. I mean, because they're eyes didn't start awesome to begin with. And so it is a, a, a journey that we're gonna work on together with that patient. So setting expectation is, is, is very important, but there's so many things in the pipeline that it's really exciting space. How do you go about educating and talking to your patients and setting expectations when it comes to dry eye and the chronicity? Like how it's, it's we can't really cure it just yet, so. Patients have been suffering. It's a quality of life issue. And most patients have been suffering for over six and a half years. So if a patient comes in chronic dry eye, it's pretty much a long history because you're gonna get so much out of there, but that also sets out expectations. And one of the key questions is how long have you had dry eye? Five years, 10 years? Well, I have very, it's exciting time. We have numerous treatment options for you. I'm gonna start with this. However, I'll see you back in four to six weeks. If you're doing great, great. If you're not, there's different therapies that we're gonna add. And so I try to give them some information, but I let them know, I'm gonna be, we're not gonna fix in a week, we're not gonna fix in a month, but I'm gonna be here with you to make sure that we, you're getting that relief that you need. 
but letting them know there's no cure. And so we're trying to minimize the impact that has on their on their daily lives. But as long as the patient's here from their doctors, they, as long as the patient know that someone's listening and someone's going to be there to help them, I mean, that that's what they that's what they want. What do you think are some of the common errors, I think, that uh, maybe just um, doctors who maybe don't specialize in dry eye, uh, do you think they misdiagnose? What are common masqueraders where they maybe... They, they, they're just calling it dry eye, but really it might be something else. Can you give us some examples of, your, do you think, the top five? Probably the most common one is going to be conjunctival chalasis. Mm. And so anytime you have the redundant conjunctival tissue, when I tell this to patients, like, what is it? I said, well, as you know, we grow up, things sag. I said, your protective coating is sagging. And the common symptom patients are going to have, they'll be, they're able to locate that, localize that pain to a certain point, have them pull down on their eyelid. If that pain goes away, then we know that it's due to the excess conjunctiva causing friction. The and drag, so, Yeah, right? the drag. And so that, that's a common mimicker. The incomplete lid seal, uh, totally mm-hmm. overlooked, uh, working on a, a study right now saying how prevalent is it within the population because we don't know. And how I know that is because I looked it up. There's not much out there. And so trying to see, you know, what is that, what is the percentage of the population? And like the example I had earlier, if it's an exposure issue, it's an exposure issue. It's not a dry issue. You may need some anti-inflammatories to calm it down, but it's all about the environment and controlling the environment. And so that's something else that comes to mind. Blepharitis, endemidex blepharitis. I mean, that's huge. We're hearing about topcolotolator. And if you're not familiar with the clinical studies, uh, average patient within the study had about grade three demodex. So anytime you see those collarettes on the base of the lashes, that's pathognomonic of demodex blepharitis. Uh, there was one study by Gao where if a patient all right, was on, uh, had a collarette, they pulled the lash, put it on a microscope. 100% of the time, it was positive for demodex. Then if the patient had no collarettes but were on lid scrubs, so that means they had blepharitis at some point, you pull the lash, 50% had Demodex. And then if you were not on lid scrubs and had no d- collarettes, you pulled the lash, 7% of patients still had Demodex. And so it is ubiquitous. You know, how much is too much? What is the normal amount? Uh, but going back to the study, uh, on average patients were grade three. Grade three is 150 mites or collarettes on the, on the, on the lids. And so one of the prince, impressive data is with topical lodoland or exdemby twice a day for six weeks, it was able to, uh, to decrease that, that count to less than 10. 50% of those patients, which was the primary endpoint, was less than two cholerates. So 150 to two. And so that's been very impressive. And that was without lid scrubs. So what um, right now beyond just all the new medications, new treatments, things coming up and going forward, what do you think is next in eye care because dry eye is huge do you think it's going to continue to be a major player or do you think there's something else that's interesting that you're interested in you're fascinated with going forward in the realm of optometry well with an optometry we know it's uh, ever-changing and so we we'll go back to one of your questions earlier about you know just being involved and you know things things that we do and so I'm past president for the Virginia Optometric Association, and so I've always been uh, very involved. Mm-hmm. I have residents and students, and I tell them, you get out of optometry what you put into optometry. And then they come to these meetings, they're like, boy, do you ever stop? Because, I, I mean, you know this as well. We're always on the go, on the go doing something. Uh, but, but we are a legislative profession, and so it's always important for us to practice that highest level of whatever state that you practice in. Uh, within Virginia, we just passed the laser laws, and so we we're able to do SLT, we're able to YAGs, we're able to LPIs, and so that's something that we're waiting for the final approval. It got passed about a year ago, but we're just waiting for the final approval to go ahead to do yeah. that, and so we're going to see the scope expansion is, is very exciting. We've been seeing it uh, across the country right now. And so just the ability for us to practice to the training that we've had, that's going to be very exciting. And so, yeah, there's a lot of different things, but I think that's going to be one of the most exciting things right now. And I think that's fantastic that you were, you were able to do that in, in, in Virginia. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think scope modernization, and that's really what it is, right? Mm-hmm. I learned 
these laser procedures back when I went to school back in like 2014 mm -hmm. and so it's really just getting things updated to the point of our of our training our ability and how we can better serve patients and, mm -hmm. and work as a team with uh, our OMD counterparts mm -hmm. so uh, so the final question I have because we've been touching a lot on dry eye and things like that and for, for sake of time one of my favorite questions to ask if you were elected mm -hmm. as a surgeon general mm -hmm. of optometry it's your job for the next year to improve optometry as a profession, to uh, help improve care for public health, any of these sort of subjects. What do you think would be the most important thing that you would want to focus on? I think it's going to be access. And so and what I mean by access is letting the, the public know exactly what we do. Mm -hmm. And we know that there's confusion oftentimes. What's an optometrist? What's an ophthalmologist? What's an optician? But having that, that public awareness campaign, and, and that takes all of us. I mean, yes, we have our state associations, we have our national association, and yes, they represent us, and we all play our part. But we as individuals have to have to take that part. Get active in your community. Let them know that you are Dr. So-and-so. I'm Dr. Whitley. You're Dr. Allen. You know, I'm here to, to, to help with whatever it may be but also letting our patients know when it comes to access that we are the primary eye care provider. Yes, we do glasses, but we do medical eye exams, we do emergency eye care, mm -hmm. because whether it's an optometry office, whether it's an ophthalmology office like mine, many times patients have emergencies, who do they go to? They go to the <laughs> urgent care, they go to the ER. What's the ER's job? And we've seen this on, on different uh, forums, like, can you believe the ER doctor did this? The ER's doctor's role is to make sure people don't die. And that's the main thing, stabilize and refer it back out to their doctor. And so, uh, so just letting our patients know exactly what we do and, and then going back to the, uh, the access and making sure patients uh, are able to come into, into our practices so we can provide them their best eye care possible. Well, Walt, thank you so much for all of your time uh, and just giving us such great information, especially in the realm of ocular disease, dry eye. And you've you've just been, I hope everybody who hasn't seen Walt present will get a chance to, to eventually hear you talk and share just great information. So thank you again for your time. Thank you. And we'll, we'll talk to you. We'll have you back on as another time because I know we had to keep this one a little bit shorter. So. All right. Anytime. Thank you. So that was our episode for today. Thank you so much for listening in. Hey, you know, I put a lot of effort into these episodes and I really want to continue bringing the most value to you and our listeners. So if you haven't done so already, please, if you're watching on YouTube, leave us a comment. Or if you're listening in on your favorite podcasting station, leave us a review over there. That'll really help us out. Thank you so much again for listening in and keep an eye on it and we'll see you in that next episode.